So we're going to learn about Parashat Bechukotai, which is the parasha that is concluding the book of Vaikra. A very, very short parasha, but then again very, very powerful, where we read both about the blessings of the Torah and the curses of the Torah which a lot of people don't like to hear that, but the Torah comes straight out and saying, <clears throat> if you do good, then there's going to be a reward for that. And if you do bad, then there's going to be a punishment. Very simple. Now comes a very big question in this parasha, and this is what all the commentaries ask throughout the history. Since this parasha is talking about the reward that we get for good things that we do, how come the parasha is not talking about Gan Eden? About heaven? Or Olam Abba, but the world to come? This is the most uh, juicy information that we want to know. Talk to me about uh, the world to come. How come the Torah is not talking about Gan Eden? There's not one place in the Torah that it's referring to the world to come. Or there's a world after, after life. And, I mean, it's talking about it in the prophets and scripts and the Talmud and the Zohar, but in the actual Torah, <clears throat> not one word of mention that there is a world above and that there's going to be a reward in the world to come. <clears throat> the same question is also asked, we're learning every Tuesday, the gates of reincarnation. Somebody not too long asked me, where does it say in the Torah about reincarnations? I don't want to hear about the Talmud, I want to hear in the Torah. It's the same thing here. How come it's not talking about Gan Eden? It's talking about all the rewards that I'm getting, chas v'shalom punishments, but how come it's not talking about Gan Eden? It's completely ignoring Gan Eden. Gan Eden is heaven, but it's uh, completely ignoring. Not only that, it's not even mentioning anything about the world to come. Gan Eden is just one place, the world to come, Olam Abba, world after that. doesn't talk about anything, just talks about this world. And of course this is only referring to, to the written Torah, because in the oral Torah, and in the Talmud and in the Zohar, and it's talking a lot about Gan Eden. But in the written Torah, you're not going to find one word about Gan Eden. So why is the Torah ignoring Gan Eden? Isn't it like a big part of my existence that there's going to be a reward one day and, and there's going to be a place where I'm going to? Now, there is a book, it's called Sefer Haikarim. The, I don't know if to translate it, the book of the main things. But uh, in Hebrew, Ikar is the main thing, and Ikarim is the fu foundation and fundamental things in our belief. It's called Sefer Ikarim. And uh, it was written by a rabbi called <coughs> Yosef Albo. And he asks, as many of the commentaries, where is Gan Eden in this parasha? Wouldn't it make sense that it will tell me also that if you do good, there's going to be a reward in the world to come? It says, I mean, the whole parasha is talking about when you do good, you'll get a good reaction, you'll get a reward. You do something bad, you'll get a bad reaction, a punishment. So he's asking also, why is the Torah ignoring Gan Eden? Now, <clears throat> interestingly, other religions only talk about is Gan Eden. They all talk about that you're going to reach to heaven and all the types of beliefs and, re and religions. I mean, look at the Muslims, the, I mean, specifically the ones who are uh, and I'm sure I can g give it as a, as a whole. I don't know much about Islam, but I know that they tell the terrorists that if they kill uh, people, they'll go to heaven and get 70 virgins or 72 virgins. I don't remember the number. I mean, so, you know, some say it's not 70 virgins. It's one virgin that she's 70 years old. So, but nevertheless, I mean, they have a promise. You go to Gan Eden. And many other religions, they, all they talk about is heaven. You go to heaven, you go to heaven, you go to a better place. So it kind of seems like uh, we, we're missing a point here and the, all the rest of the nations are promoting heaven. <clears throat> the question is why? The question why is the Torah chooses to ignore Gan Eden? And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, because it's a very important thing to know. So, like I said, it's a very short parasha. If you were attended the shul yesterday, you saw that also the parasha of last week was very short, Behar. Chik chak, very usually they read together, so it's kind of long. But both these parashot are extremely short. 
And uh, not only that, it's a, a very important parasha because it has the, all the rewards, but also it has the rebuke, the tochecha. If you do this, this is going to happen. If you do that, all the punishment. Most people can't can bear to listen to it because it's actually it's a kind of a turn-off. What, are you telling me now I'm going to be uh, striked with diseases and all, all the, what, the, what the Torah is going through? But nevertheless... It's a very important parasha because it gives you the uh, good uh, evaluation of uh, what happens. Now, we find in this parasha 30 verses of curses, specifically. And these are pretty severe curses, different diseases and afflictions and, and uh, hunger and, and many bad things. <clears throat> but before that, it has 13 verses of, of blessings. So you have 30 verses of curses and 13 verses of blessings. Now, it seems like there's more curses than blessing. But nevertheless, our sages have uh, bro broke it down that it's broken into five topics. Forget about the quantity of the verses, rather the topics. And our sages kind of summarize it. There, there are five topics of curses and five topics of uh, uh, Blessings, not necessarily topics, but uh, more categories of topics. Nevertheless, when you're looking at the positive side, then uh, it starts with the success of the land, because it says, "If you go in my laws, I will give you your rain, and the land will grow, and there will be prosperity, and business will be go good, and so forth." So it's talking about the success of the land. Now, basically saying, if you be good, you'll get everything. You'll have peace, you'll have success, you'll have parnasa, you'll have sustenance, and you'll have all the good things. All you need to do is follow my rules. And if you follow the rules, I promise you everything that you need in this world. Now, most people, their agenda in this world is money. They want parnasa toga. But how about having a good marriage? That's a pretty big thing. To have peace in my home. And to be healthy, that's a pretty big thing. What, what good is your, health, uh, is your money if you're not healthy? So there's a lot of things in this world that we want and we wish for ourselves. So we want to have parnasadova, we want to have good, good uh, sustenance, we have, uh, want to have a good livelihood, we want to have success, we want to have love and health, peace and so forth. But if chas v'shalom I don't do what the Torah tells me, then it brings me down these curses, specifically broken into these five categories. Now, it seems like there's more curses than blessing, if you actually read the Torah. First of all, there's 30 verses of curses and 13 verses of blessing. So by default, it seems like there's more curses. But even when you listen to it, it sounds as much more curses. Now, really, there's much more blessing than curses. Because the hint here, is that if you read the parasha, the part of the blessings, it starts with the letter Aleph and learn, ends with the letter Taf. Im im tilechu, starts with the letter Aleph and it finished. So the first letter in the parasha is Aleph and the last letter is Taf. To basically tell us that if you go in my, you, in my, you follow my rules, there's A to Z, Aleph Ataf, you get everything. But if you're looking at the part of the Klalot, it starts with the letter Vav, and it earn, le, uh, ends with the letter He, right? It starts with, uh, 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 it's basically coming to tell you what's between Vav and He, there's nothing. I mean, it's, it goes backwards, so to say. To hint to you that uh, the curses, they are very limited. Blessings, it's A to Z, Aleph Adaf, whatever you want, I'll include it. I'll invent blessings for you. But with curses, it is what it is, and there's not more than that. So this is already good news, and it, at least the Torah comes and tells you, yes, there is curses, there is rebuke, there is a, a, a reaction or something negative. But don't worry, when it comes to the positive, there's an abundance. Now, <clears throat> another thing that we see here is that the blessings in the Torah are given in an order, in sequence. And, and on the other hand, the curses are coming gradual, in uh, one stage after the other. The blessings are just given. 
It says very clearly, and it comes in a sequence. The first peace, and, and health, and happiness. And, but when it comes to the curses, it comes one grade, and then another grade, like gradual. The first, uh, the first uh, curse, it says, if you don't do what I tell you, there's going to be diseases. And it starts mentioning the diseases. And I don't know if you checked lately, but 99% of this world is, have, has, are sick. But nevertheless, and then it says, if you don't listen to me, above what you didn't listen up to now, I will add another level of a punishment. That's going to really going to be hunger. And again, in our generation, you know that probably half the population of this world is hungry or under the line of uh, poverty. Not to talk about millions of people in different countries that they're starving, completely starving. But even in, uh, in third world countries, you, in, in, in uh, modern countries, you'll see that the a quantity of poverty is unbelievable. And then the Torah continues, says, and if you're going to continue not listening to me, I'm going to go to the next level. I'm going to uh, attack, so to say, with evil animals. That's how it's called, chayot rot. Now again, in our generation, I mean, where, where, where do you see that? And people also get attacked. You know how many people were bitten by dogs in this, in this right this, in this area in the last couple of months? That's not a normal thing. One of the ladies who come here all the time, she, a, dog, a dog ripped her face to pieces. Sarut, you know, the dog completely attacked her. My bystand was attacked by a dog two months ago. Luckily, it was only a scratch. There was another uh, man here from the community, Chaim, also was attacked severely by a dog. Had to get, I think, like, I don't know, 15 shots of rabies. Was got sick, the whole winter was sick. And just here around here, how many attacks from dogs? So, it's not normal. It's not normal. My son was attacked by Baruch Hashem, nothing happened, just a scratch. But a huge German shepherd literally jumped on him and bit him in his hand. So, so we see also in our uh, 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 generation, there is uh, a lot of uh, problems with bad animals. You know how many people uh, uh, died just here in Israel from rabies the last year? A lot of people, like 40, 50 people. That's, uh, listen, we're, this is a modern country. To die from rabies? Well, what are we, in Africa, we're living with raccoons? So, uh, uh, this is a modern country. Now they're afraid here in the north of Israel because a lot of the animals, the wildlife, they're, they're getting rabies. And they have to now start killing a lot of the wildlife here. We have around Tzfat, there's a lot of, uh, there's uh, coyotes, you know coyotes, uh, uh, how do you call them? Uh, yeah, and not wolves. There's wolves too. Uh, no, uh, hyenas. Hyenas. You hear them. You hear them at night. I don't know where they come from. They come from hell. But but uh, but uh, nevertheless, I mean, around Sfat, there's bobcats. There's uh, there's some wild animals. A lot of them have uh, rabies. But nevertheless, you hear a lot in our generation about problems with animals. Now the the Torah continues and says, and if you're going to continue not listening to me. There's going to be war. The, the, word, the, the way the Torah is talking about it is talking about cherev no kemet, a revenging sword. There's going to be war. Half the world is under war. And then it continues, it says, and if you're going to continue not listening to me, there's going to be destruction. Look how much destruction is in our generation and in previous generations. Tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes and, and all sorts of other problems. And then the Torah continues, and says, and if you're going to, still not going to listen to me, there's going to be exile. So you see, there's a, gradually, if you're not going to listen, I'll make it worse. You continue not to listen, I'll make it worse. You continue, kind of like giving us these uh, exit points that Hashem says, listen, I'll give you a chance, just relax, just stop with your bad behavior. And if uh, you're not, it's going to increase and increase and increase. Now, why do we have these stops? So a person can make a calculation with themselves, to make an uh, analogy. And a person needs to make on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a some type of an analogy, why things are not working out lately. If everything is going smooth, good, no complaints. But do you know anybody that everything is going smooth? I, don't, I never met with such a person. I uh, encounter thousands of people. I never met one person that came and told me, you know what, life is amazing. 
Everything is smooth. <laughs> Money is coming from all directions. My wife is amazing. My kids are unbelievable health. I'm like Iron Man. Everything is unbelievable. I never met such a person in my life. Every people, every person has at least a whole pile of problems. If it's not money, then it's health. If it's not health, it's relationships. If it's not relationships, it's, it's a million and one headaches. Everybody has problems. So a person needs to sit sometime, at least once a day, or worst case, once a week, and say, hey, why is things not working out? Why is this business deal not working out? Why is this transaction to buy or sell my house is not working out? Why I have issues with my spouse? Why I have problems with that specific person in the congregation? Why am I not getting along with him? I'm a good person. I get along with everybody. With him, I'm not getting along. So when things go wrong, it's for me to question why things are not going so well for me. And we all can question that on a daily basis. We can question that on an hourly basis probably. Why is this not working out? Why is not not working out? Kadosh Baruch is giving me these uh, exit points that I can come. Something's not going to work out. Say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Why is it not working out? Sometimes I'm not going to find an answer. Sometimes it's going to be like it's not working out because it's not meant to be. But a lot of the things that are not working out is because of me. Because I'm doing something and I'm bringing on myself this energy or this uh, reaction and it's not working out. Now, <clears throat> really what does Hashem want when He punishes us? I mean, everybody wants to be, uh, uh, you know, in Hebrew there's a term to that. It's called Yefei Nefesh. I don't even, I never found the term in English for Yefei Nefesh is that everything is good and everything is, uh, is this is not, not the reality. This is living in La La Land. So a lot of people say, oh, Hashem is so amazing and He loves everybody and He... Yes, Hashem is amazing, but if you do something wrong, He will punish you. Don't think for one second that Hashem is just going to give up or, or ignore something. People live in some fantasy world that, no, no, I can do whatever, Hashem loves me. Yeah, yeah, I also love my kids, but when they don't behave nice, I punish them. Not because I want to punish them, because I want to educate them. So Hashem says also, listen, you're going to go off the path. I'm going to give you a smack to wake you up. So what is the agenda? Why Hashem wants to punish us? I mean, after all, we do believe, we know, Hashem is ultimate good. He's not looking to punish anybody, but He still punishes us. Why? What's the point here? The punishment is that... It's to educate me. It's to put me back to my, uh, to, to put me back on my path. But the difference is, is when Hashem punishes me, He punishes me from love. Not because He wants to revenge or because He's upset. It's only from love. I also punish my kids. You ask my kids, they'll tell you my father is very tough. There's no way, no way games in, in, in my shift. They can take advantage of their mother maybe. But, uh, you know, something's not going on. I hear sometimes, I'm going to call Abba. <laughs> Suddenly, whoop, the, 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 the atmosphere changes. I, I will hear noise, I will hear screaming, and then I'll hear the threat. I'm calling Abba. No, 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 it's okay, I'm going in the shower. Don't call him. So, <laughs> I grew up with a very strict father. He was very loving and very caring, but he was a general, so I had to stand uh, attention all the time. That's how you call it in English, right? Attention? So, I'm not joking, my father's a general. There was an army in the house. My shoes weren't clean, it would be a problem. So, but then again, he was full of love. He gave a lot of love and a lot of attention, and in his way. But the house had to be, if I move the wrong way, I get detained to the base. So, but nevertheless, it's good. It's good to get education. I'm very strict with my kids. They get unconditional love. They get everything they want. But I'm tough and I'm firm. And if they do something wrong, they'll be punished. The difference is, it's coming from love. It's not coming because I'm psycho. Or because I need to let my anger on somebody. Some fathers, they come home, they, 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 they had a bad day at work. The poor kid gets it. So this is not punishment, that's uh, uh, not normal behavior. That's letting your anger on somebody else. Buy a punching bag or bang your head at the wall. But Hashem, when He punishes, He punishes with love. He says, I, want, I don't want you to go off. I want you to, to, to be educated. So the point is when you punish somebody, even us, we're looking at ourselves as educators. We have kids, we have, we have uh, people to educate. When I punish somebody, is for them to understand that it's for their benefit. 
when I'm punishing my kid, it's not to, to, to have some kind of a power trip here. I'm stronger than you. Then you're not doing anything here. When I punish my kid, is for him to understand that what I'm doing, he's not happy with it, but he knows that it's for his benefit. That's how you really punish, and that's how Hashem punishes. So when the Torah comes and gives me all these curses, don't get discouraged and say Hashem is mean. Hashem is punishing me for my own benefit. If I don't understand it's for my own benefit, the problem is with me, not with Hashem. So <clears throat> that's why the Kadosh Baruch Hu is bringing it in the punishment gradually. One, one level, you know, do it, I'll give another level, you're not going to listen, I'll do another level, and so forth. Now, again, brings us to the, to the big question, so why isn't this parasha coming and telling me, and by the way, there is a Gan Eden, you do good, you'll go into heaven, and you'll get a reward. I'm not telling you right now that it's said about Gehenom, that, that should have been also in the Klalot, but we want to concentrate on Gan Eden, about heaven. Now, <clears throat> there is some sources about the, the uh, world to come, and uh, the Torah is not talking about Gan Eden. Now, there is a concept when we, when we learn in many different places that it says that the right hand is the right, the hand that pulls somebody close, and the left hand is the hand is the pushes. In Hebrew you say, Yemin mekarevet the small docha, that the right hand is the one that comes and pulls somebody close to you, like a hug, and the left hand is the one that pushes. This is the, again the idea of the sachar and onish, the reward and the punishment. But why specifically the right and the left? is because usually most people are, are righties, not in their political opinions, in their, in their uh, thank you, in their, uh, in, in the, how they use their hand. So usually the right hand is the more stronger one, and the left one is the more weaker hand. That's the majority of people, that the right hand is stronger. So the reason why, the reason why the sages teach us that the right hand is the one who's pushing you and the left is pushing, because you always want to push with the weaker hand. Because if you push with the strong hand, it will be more, more severe. So, same thing here. That when I punish somebody, it has to be done with a more of a, in, from the weaker side in me. Not to, do, not to be so severe. But anyway, that's just something to, for us to learn as a side note. Because we're all, at the end of the day, we're all educators. And uh, we have to know that educating is not to me feel powerful over somebody else. So as uh, to bring somebody to understand that, that what they're doing is wrong. But nevertheless, nevertheless, again, we're constantly going back to the same question is why isn't the Torah talking about Gan Eden? And why isn't the Torah uh, telling me that there's a reward in the world above? The Shura, Torah should tell me there's a reward in this world, but there's also a reward in the world above. I think the Torah should uh, make some space for that, but nevertheless it doesn't. Now, <clears throat> there is a commentary, uh, not exactly a commentary, but hundreds of years ago, there's a certain book, it's called the book Hakuzari, written by a, a rabbi, Yehuda Levi. And he says that the, the, he's giving a, a parable of a king, and he says, that the other nations, other religions, are so to say better than our religion because it does talk about heaven all the time, and uh, and he says, on in your religion, then it's only talking about Geshen, but rain. In other religion, it says you'll do good, you go to heaven, but in your religion, you do good, you get rain. That's what the Torah says. If you walk in my path and you follow my rules, I will give you rain. Rain. That's what I'm getting. I want to get Gan Eden. I don't want to get rain. But nevertheless. So, how do we know that there is a Gan Eden? If I will only, only read the Torah, how would I know that there's a heaven and there's a hell? There's a Gan Eden and Gehenom. So Gan Eden is mentioned when Abraham goes into the cave and he smells Gan Eden and he decides that's what he's going to bury somewhere. 
Yeah, but that's, that's, uh, it can be referred to Gan Eden, the way Adam Arishon and Chava were here. It's not talking about the Gan Eden in the world to come. Because where did Adam and Chava were placed? The Gan Eden. It says also Adam and Chava were placed in Gan Eden. But it's talking about a place here in this world. So Adam, when Abraham Avinu was smelling the smell of Gan Eden, it also says about, uh, about uh, Yaakov that he was smelling the smell of Gan Eden. Okay, so the Mishulam, the Yoret called Hodesh Bagatis Shrai. Again, I think we and Okama Pamim. So, also, it says when, when, uh, when Yitzchak was about to give Yaakov the blessing and Yaakov walked in, it says that he smelled the smell of Gan Eden. But nevertheless, it's referring to, to the Gan Eden in this world where Adam and Chava were, not the Gan Eden in the world above. But nevertheless, Olam Baba, the world to come. So where do we, how do we really know that there is a Gan Eden? Forget about the Torah, the Torah doesn't tell me, but how do I really know? So there are many places in the Tanakh, in the scripts, and the prophets that it's talking about Gan Eden. Where's the first time that we're finding the story about Gan Eden? It's about, uh, in the book of Shmuel, talking about a certain uh, lady, her name is Avigail, and she was uh, married to a certain individual called Naval, Naval Carmeli. He was a very rich uh, businessman, had a lot of uh, fields and a lot of uh, uh, property, and he was, a, he was a, not a nice guy. Everything was crooked, Everything was uh, not honest, but his wife was uh, apparently somewhat not the same. Anyways, at the time, uh, David Amelech was still not king, and uh, he was the uh, leader of a group of like uh, these uh, young, uh, young uh, troublemakers, and uh, they made him his, the, the leader, and uh, they needed to somehow eat. So they came to this Navala Carmeli and they told him, we'll work for you in the fields, just feed us. Okay. So they worked for him for a whole month. And then they came and says, uh, give us our money. It's food, something. He says, no, I don't want to pay you. You don't want to pay us. <laughs> you don't want to pay us. We worked for you. We had a deal. No, I don't want to pay you. So they said, oh, you don't want to pay us? <laughs> no problem. We'll show you. We'll show you what it is not to pay us. And they wanted to uh, come and burn the whole thing down. They literally want to come, and the, the plan was to come and burn his estate. His wife comes out, and uh, she tells David Amelech, David Amelech, when well, he wasn't the king then, he was just a young man, but David Amelech stands in the front, and uh, they're coming with fire, and they're about to, to burn the whole thing down. They said, we're going to show you. So the Abigail comes out, and she says, listen, don't, don't, uh, don't do that. And then she says a verse that up until today, this verse is written on all the tombstones of the Jewish cemetery. <clears throat> we don't write the whole verse, rather we write an acronym. All the matzevot, all the tombstones, you'll see that it's written on it. Well, not all of them. Some of them you see they're completely clear. But what does she tell him? She tells him, don't, don't, uh, don't burn down the state. And she says a verse, nefesh adoni that your nefesh, talking about David Melech, your nefesh, your soul, should be a, a, a placed in, a, in the world above, for etern, in the place of souls for eternity. That's what we write on, um, on tombstones. It has an acronym of Taf Nun Tzadik Bet Hey Hey. That's uh, what they write on the... Yeah. The acronym, you see it as letters on all, uh, well, not all, but very common. And it's the acronym of this verse. nefesh That the nefesh of my master, of you, should be placed in the, so to say, the bank of souls and the place where all the souls are for eternity. And she, and she tells him that. Meaning to saying to David and Melech, the first time we find in the Tanakh that she's talking about this going to be a world above. And what is she telling him? If you don't burn the estate, you'll get your reward. I know you want to get your pay right now. But if you don't do it, you'll get your reward in the world to come. 
<coughs> then she continues, and she says, she basically says to David the Melech, uh, hold your horses, don't, don't be impulsive. You'll get your reward in Gan Eden. But then she continues and says, but my husband, she says, V'nefesh ba'ali yikla'ena bekaf ha'kela. And the nefesh of my husband, the Kadosh Baruch is going to, so to say, uh, shoot it in a, what's called a kaf ha'kela, it's a slingshot. And this is the first time we hear in Tanakh about this punishment in the world above that is called kaf ha'kela. Kaf ha'kela is a slingshot. And the same say you take a stone in a slingshot and you stretch it and then you release and the stone goes flying. There is a place in the world about, it's called Kafa Kela, that they take a soul and they shoot the soul from one place to the universe to the other side of the universe. This is the first time we hear in Tanakh also about the punishment of Gienom, of Kafa Kela. And she says, and because my husband was wrong with you, he will get punished in the world above. So you will get your reward in the world above and my husband will get punished in the world above. The first time in the Tanakh that we see the, uh, uh, a source that it's talking about what's waiting there. Now, after that, this is nice, but there's a much more stronger source, three chapters after that, that we learn about the world above. And the story goes that Shaul was the king, and he wasn't doing that great. And then uh, it was the final war, he went into war. Now he had a problem. The war was not going so well. He was losing the war. And he didn't have who to ask what to do. Because at the time, the prophet of the generation was Shmuel. And he died. So he didn't have who to ask uh, what to do. And the war was getting worse and worse and worse. And they're losing the war. And he didn't have who to ask for advice. So what does he do? He decides to do a sin. And he goes to a fortune teller. Ma'alat uh, Ov and he tells her bring the nefesh of Shmuel from above, I need to talk to him and I need to ask him what should I do with this war and this is a, war, this is a sin, you're not allowed to do that it's like called a seance you're not allowed to bring a soul from the world above to ask a question so he decided to do this sin <coughs> and the fortune teller, or however it's called, the witch woman, whatever, I mean in Hebrew it's called Malat Ov. Malat Ov is that she elevates from a soul from the world above. She comes back to him and she says, uh, I spoke to Shmuel, and his child says, so what did he say? What should I do with this war? So she said, well, he didn't have good news to say. He said that tomorrow you and your sons are going to be with him. Basically telling you, you're going to be dead tomorrow. So, and that's exactly what happened. The next day he died, and his sons, and he was uh, going to the world above. But what does it tells us very, very clearly? That the, the soul lives after its death. This is the first time in Tanakh that the Tanakh is telling us, somebody dies, Shmuel died, and he goes to the world above. And Shaul was able to bring, bring the soul down. Not him, the, the, the fortune teller, the witch, whatever it's called. And she was able to bring the soul down. Basically saying, in other words, there's a world above. The soul, the body dies, but the soul continues. So, here we say another uh, 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 proof for the world above. Now, technically when you read all this, it makes sense that there's going to be a world above. Kind of doesn't make sense when there's no continuation. What, I came to this world for 70 years to eat potatoes and leave? It doesn't make sense even. You know, even when I wasn't observant and I didn't have any connection to the Torah, this thing didn't resonate well with me. I wasn't like a big philosopher, but I, didn't, I didn't, definitely didn't look, turn to Judaism. I, I believed in one of the weirdest things. I believed in aliens and different universes. I don't know where my mind, my mind was going to. But nevertheless, it didn't sit well with me that I only came here for 67 years and I'm done. I didn't believe, I said there has to be something out of this universe. I just believed in aliens. I thought that there are other universe, universes in the, in the galaxies and there's other places. Anyways, I believe in all sorts of nonsense, but it didn't resonate well. It makes sense that it has to be a continuation because if there isn't, then where's the justice in this world? If there isn't something waiting after. Because this world is, uh, 
This world doesn't seem that there's justice here. So it has to be something. And I'll give you an example, a story, what I mean. One of our greatest sages of all times was Rabbi Akiva. We just now finished uh, commemorating the death of his 24,000 students. And he didn't even have a YouTube channel. And he had 24,000 students. Now, with YouTube, no problem. Every schmo has thousands of followers. So, uh, somebody once told me not too long ago, wow, you know, you're better than Rabbi Akiva. You have 150,000 followers. He says, well, Rabbi Akiva didn't have a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, Rabbi Akiva was a great sage. And he died on Kiddush Hashem. You know how he died? On Yom Kippur, he was 120 years old. One of the few people that lived till 120. And he made tshuva, of course, when he was 40 years old. 40 years he learned. When he, became, when he turned 80, he became the rabbi, the, the, the chief rabbi of the generation. And then he led the generation for another 40 years. And unbelievable what he did. Look at the students that came out of Rabbi Akiva, not the ones who died. The next generation, his students is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the author of the Zohar, Rabbi Meir, and just look who came out of Rabbi Akiva. <coughs> and then, how does he end his life? On Yom Kippur. On Yom Kippur. The Romans come, they take him out of the shul, and they slice his flesh with combs of steel till he dies. And, you know, when that happened, his students, were, they couldn't fathom to see that. And as the Romans are combing his flesh with steel, with combs of steel, he's screaming, Shema Israel. And when he says Hashem Echad, when he says Echad, he, he dies. At that moment, all the angels of the heavens came out, and they, they couldn't understand. And the angels say to Hashem, this is the Torah, and this is the reward. The angels, I'm not talking about humans. The humans couldn't fathom what they're seeing right now. The students. But the angels come out and they question Hashem. I don't understand. That's the Torah? He dedicated his life for Torah. 80 years of his life was dedicated for the Torah and for his students. And that's how he dies? In torture, in pain? Where's the justice here? So you know what the Kadosh Baruch Hu answers? Chilkam b'chaim. Two words. Chilkam b'chaim. His portion is up there, not here. The person who dies on Kiddush Hashem, the, whatever you do in this world, you don't get anything in this world. You got everything in the world above. Your portion is in the world above. Talking about the world above. Now, so it means, what do you learn from this story? has to be justice, has to be something up there. What kind of a justice? You see that person devoted his life to the Torah for 80 years and he's not getting anything. So common sense is, has to be something in the world above. There's another story in the Talmud about a certain rabbi, his name was Rabbi Yaakov, and he sits one day in the park, nice day, sunny day like today, he sits in the park, he has his uh, juice, his coffee, whatever he's having there, and he sees a father and son walking together, Suddenly, he hears the squeak of a bird, gets his attention, and the father that is walking with the son looks up on the tree, he hears the bird, and right away he's thinking, hey, hey wait a minute, I can do a big mitzvah here that it's uh, in the Torah, uh, it's called Shiluah uh, HaKen, scaring the mother bird off, away, and taking the, the eggs. Okay, so he tells his son, hey, let's do the mitzvah of Shiluah HaKen. Go home and get a ladder. The boy runs home, gets a ladder. They put the ladder on the tree. The boy goes up on the tree. He gets the nest, and as he's taking the nest, he falls down and he dies. This is Rabbi Yaakov standing there and saying, what? What just happened here? There are three mitzvot in the Torah that the reward is a long life. The, two of them is the mitzvah of Shiluah HaKen, as scaring the bird away, and the other one is honoring your parents. It says, Kabed et avicha v'yimecha l'mani arichun yamecha. Honor your parents, so you should live a long life. So he's looking and saying, this boy just did two mitzvot, that the Torah is giving a reward of a long life, and the boy dies. That doesn't make sense. Where's the long life here? 
So what are the two options here? The first option is that it's all fake. The Torah is fake. That's what he understands from that. What's the other option? That must be Olam Abba. Has to be the Arichut Yamim, the long life that it's talking about. It's talking about the world to come. So when it's talking about in this world that you do a mitzvah and you get a long life, you know, one of the Ten Commandments is honor your parents. Honor your father and mother. That you will deserve, get, get a long life. Now it doesn't talk about here you're going to live till 90. It means that you're going to get a long life, you're going to get Olam Abba. A very long life, Olam Abba, the world to come is eternal. That's what it's talking about, Arichut Yamim. So, must be, if you look in common sense, has to be Olam Abba. Has to be something, because if not, what would the, why would the Torah tell me to do here? To torture me, and that's it? So even if you're looking at the common sense of it, I understand that it has to be a Torah. It has to be a Olam Abba. So I come back to square one. So why is the Torah ignoring the Olam Abba? Why is the Torah not telling me there is a Olam Abba? Why is the Torah telling me there is a Gan Eden? Why? That's what I want to know. That's my question. Now, there is a verse in the book of Kohelet. I think uh, numerous times I have asked kindly not to... Uh, not to make me say it in English, I never figure out how to say the, the, tenor, the tenoremi, how do you say Kohelet in English? The book of Shlomo HaMelech. Uh, uh, what? Uh, how? Uh, yeah, see that's why I can't even uh, klist uh, the Kohelet. Kohelet. So, <laughs> all the books of Shlomo HaMelech in English, I can't say them. So. Greek. Anyways, anyways, the book is Kohelet, and it says there a verse, uh, that the ashes will go back to the land as it was, referring when a person dies, what happens, you know, from the ashes you came, and from the, that's where you go back to. And uh, this is what the verse says, that when a person dies, the ashes, the element of afar, enemy of earth, goes back to the earth as it was and and the spirit will go back to Hashem. This is what it says in the verse there. Basically saying in other words, when a person dies, what's the result? The body goes into the ground. You came from the earth, from the ground, that's where you go back to. And the spirit, the Ruch, goes up to Hashem that He created, He gave it to. So in this verse, it's already telling me uh, what's going to happen when a person dies. Now, there is a commentary on the Torah by the commentary that is called Kliakar. Now, Kliakar, he gives, he was very troubled by many other commentaries about why the Torah is not talking about Gan Eden. So he brought down seven answers why the Torah is not talking about Gan Eden. Now, we're not going to have time to go through all seven of them. We're only going to go through two of them. But with what it says in the book of Kohelet, that the person dies and he goes into the ground, what does the verse says? The, the, the afar chozer el adama, but the ruach, the spirit goes to Hashem because he gave it to him. <coughs> so, with that said, there are two commentaries why the Gan Eden is not mentioned in the Torah. The first one is, is a very uh, funny way of, 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 of uh, saying it, but it's kind of like saying in our generation, come on, come on. That's what's going to convince you? Gan Eden is what's going to convince you now to do something? A person, or chas v'shalom, hell. A person now has a strong desire to do a sin. A man goes in the street, sees a beautiful woman, and all he thinks about is a sin, to, do, to be with her. Now, Gan Eden is going to convince him not to do the sin? He doesn't see right now Gan Eden. He sees the woman. Or this is one example out of many. A person now is about to sin. Somebody will come and whisper and tells him, please don't do the sin, there's Gan Eden. Yeah, who cares about Gan Eden? I see the cookie right now, I care about the cookie. So the commentary says, come on, <laughs> that's what's going to stop you from doing something? Thinking that in 90 years I might go to somewhere? A person is, has a, a, a burning desire to do a sin, nothing will convince him to stop that sin. 
You know what will convince him to stop doing the sin? Listen, if you go do the sin tomorrow, your stocks all the way down. Oh, that's what stops the person from doing the sin, the stocks. Or the business deal. I know many men that uh, unfortunately they battle different, uh, different uh, bad habits. Whether it's gambling, women, whatever it is. And uh, I need to find creative ways how to get them to control themselves. Now, if I'm going to tell a man that his, uh, his urge, his desire now is to do a sin, what am I going to tell him? You're going to be barbecued and get home. You know, you're going to put you in a skewer. You think it's going to stop him? He doesn't care. But you know when he cares? Listen, if you do this sin right now, the business deal is out. Oh, no, 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 the business is, no, 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 no. I have a friend like that. That's, that's how I convince him to do things. I talk about he has a lot of business. So I, I blame everything on the business. So he was dating a, a, a non-Jewish girl for a long, very long time. And, uh, and I kept telling him, listen, you shouldn't uh, date her. You should find a nice Jewish uh, girl. And he's like, I can't, get, I can't leave her. I can't leave her. She's, uh, she's this, she's that. And every time I would tell him, listen, you stay with her. You'll see the business is not going to work so well. You're going to have all sorts of issues in, in your business. And every time it would work exactly how I would say and I told him, if you do this and that, it will work good. And, and Baruch Hashem, Hashem is always on my side. And I told him, I was trying to convince him to eat kosher. And I told him, I, I guarantee to you that if you eat kosher, you'll have success in business. Ooh, really? <laughs> so he ate kosher. So every time he didn't eat kosher, business didn't go well. And one time he called me and he told me, I'm going to believe everything you tell me. I was like, good. <laughs> Why? He's like, because... He told me, you know how you told me that if I eat kosher, I'll have success in business? So I was doing it, and it was working good for a while. But then, to tell you the truth, the last couple of months, I wasn't eating kosher. And he says, you know what, I don't know why today, I suddenly got this uh, idea that I have to eat kosher, because business is not going well, so this is the last couple of months, the business was not going well. I remember what you told me, I decided I'm going to eat kosher. He's like, I drove half an hour to a kosher restaurant, till I found a kosher restaurant. And you know what happened? As I was sitting in the restaurant, you know, in the booth behind, two men are sitting and talking about some land that is about to go out to the, to the public to be auctioned. And he's hearing the, the, he's overhearing the conversation and they're talking about this land and he turns around, long story short, he made a deal right on the spot, made a lot of money. A lot, of, a lot of money from this deal was able to get the land, somehow switch, swap, whatever it is. He made a very good business deal. He tells me, you see, I drove half an hour to eat kosher and I made a business deal. I told him, hey, are you telling me? That's what I've been telling you. So now everything that I tell him, he listens. If I tell him, don't do this, it's not good for business. Oh, no, 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 the business, the business. So, so that's how I get to him, through the business. So we think I'm gonna, if I'm going to tell him, listen, don't drive on Shabbat because you're going to go to Genom. Ah, Genom. If I tell him, listen, you drive on Shabbat, the business deals next week are not going to work so well. The containers from China, the, 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 the ship is going to sink in the, in, the, in the ocean. He brings things from China. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, so that's, that's what, <laughs> that's what uh, drives him, the, something physical. That's why the first commentary says, why well, talk about Alam Abba? It's not going to affect anybody. It's not going to affect anybody when you say you're going to get a Gan Eden. Tell a person in this world, listen, you're going to observe Shabbat. Tomorrow you're going to make good money in business. Oh, someone going to observe Shabbat. So, so the first commentary says, well, why bother? Why bother? It's not going to affect anybody. Tell the person he's going to get a reward in this world. He'll do it for the reward in this world. There's another commentary, a very interesting commentary brought by Rambam, by Maimonides. And he says, you know what the Torah is not talking about Gan Eden? Very simple. Because the Torah doesn't want to give you or promise you any reward. If I'm going to talk about Gan Eden, it means I, have, I owe you now. I, hold, I owe you a reward. What if I don't want to give it to you? The Torah is not talking about Gan Eden. It's according to Rambam. Because it doesn't want to promise you any reward. Rambam says the Torah tells you, serve Hashem for the sake of Hashem. Don't, don't look for rewards here. Serve Hashem, L'Hashem Shemai, for the sake of Hashem. So if this is the case... So why is the Torah is talking about the blessing in this world? So that's a, that's a question on the commentary of Rambam. If Rambam is saying, listen, the Torah doesn't want to give you a reward. 
If Hashem wants to give you a reward, He will give you. But He doesn't want to guarantee and He's not promising anything. You do, you do, maybe yes, yes, no, no. So comes a question on that commentary. So if this is the case, so why are you telling me I'm going to get a reward in this world? I don't know, that's what we're reading. You do this, you look at that. So the answer is very, very simple that what the Torah is talking in this parasha, it's not a reward. It's the conditions, the working conditions. If you go and work now, now, if you are uh, self-employed, you have a business, you are uh, eight, not an agent, uh, how do you call it, a freelancer, then you, you do the job, you come with your own tools, with your own supplies, and you give a bill. But if I go and work for somebody, they need to give me everything. I'm not coming with tools from home. So if I go now to a job and they tell me, this is the job, I need to do A, B, and C, and to do the job, I'm also giving you conditions, whether you need a car, a truck, uh, uh, tools. So the reward that the Torah is talking about in this parasha is not a reward, it's just the working conditions. It's telling you, you're gonna have to get some type of conditions here. If I'm now a salesperson to a company, they need to give me a car. How am I gonna get to their meeting? They need to give me a phone. They need to give me money to put gas. They, this is not a reward. This is a, a can part of the job description. It's part of the working the conditions. It's not a salary. Salary? Well, we're not discussing a salary here. We're discussing your job. Same thing here. The Torah says, I'm not discussing a salary with you. I'm discussing the job description. The job description, do mitzvot, learn Torah. And you're going to get uh, 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 working conditions. So I'll give you parnasa. I'll give you health. If you're not going to have health, how are you going to work? If I'm, uh, if I'm not going to give you a, 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 a rain, how are you going to be productive here? So the reward that the Torah is talking about has nothing to do with, a, with, a, with, a, with my paycheck, with my salary. Oh, salary? You want to talk about a salary? Mm, negotiate with Hashem when you go up to Shemaim. Who says you're going to get a salary? What, are you working for a salary? You serve Hashem for the sake of Hashem, for the sake of serving Him. So Amram says, listen, the Torah doesn't want to give you any promises. Therefore, serve Hashem for the sake of serving Hashem. That's it. Now, <clears throat> to uh, kind of uh, emphasize the idea, so there's a beautiful story that kind of uh, teaches us the, the idea of serving Hashem for the, for the sake of serving Hashem. <clears throat> there is a great tzaddik that lived over 200 years ago. His name is Levi Yitzchak from Bardichov. You're going to visit his uh, grave this week, this week, next week? Tuesday. Tuesday. Send his regards. And Baruch uh, Hashem, we have this chud, we learn from his teachings uh, almost every day here. But nevertheless, he was a great, great tzaddik, uh, one of the students of the Magid from Azrij, buried in the Ukraine. And uh, there's a story with him that one time uh, came the holiday of Sukkot. It was a very bad time, and nobody had an etrog. The entire city doesn't have an etrog. They don't know what to do. How are we going to say that? This is a, this is a mitzvah doraita. This is a mitzvah from the Torah. We have to say a blessing on the etrog. We have to shake the lulav. What are we going to do? They went everywhere. They couldn't find an etrog. Okay. A day before the holiday, a rich merchant passes through that town. And they, you know, they, they, uh, they try, to, uh, they attempt everything. Every person that ever just were in the area, they asked him. So this merchant is crossing the town. They tell him, do you by any chance, we see you here, for, you're traveling for business. By any chance, do you have an atrog? <laughs> of course I have, I have an atrog. Oh, maybe you would want to stay with us uh, here in the city of Bardichov. And that the whole way we can all uh, bless on your atrog. He says, no, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Why? He says, you know, I'm on this business trip for half a year and my wife didn't see me, my kids didn't see me. I want to do the holiday at home. And I tell him, listen, the whole city, we don't even have one at all. If you stay with us, the whole city will be able to do this mitzvah. Sorry, I can't help you. And I tell him, listen, you know who lives in the city? The great Levi Yitzchak from Bardichov. I don't care who lives in this city. I'm going home. My wife didn't see me for half a year. Look at my wagons. I'm full of presents for my kids. I'm going home. I haven't been at home from Pesach. And they're telling him, listen, please stay with us. We don't have a tog. Okay, nothing penetrated this man's mind. 
So they decided to take him to Levi Yitzchak, to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe himself tells him, please, if you don't mind, the whole city, we don't even have one etrog. If you stay here, you're going to be mezaket, all of us here. You're going to make all of us say this, uh, do this mitzvah. He says to him, Rebbe, I'm very sorry. I can't, I can't, I just can't. What does Rebbe Levi Le 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 Yitzchak from Bardichov tells him? He tells him two words. He says, you're going to be with me in my Gan Eden. I will make sure that you get my Gan Eden. You're going to sit with me. He tells him, Iti b'mechitzati, with me and next to me. He's basically saying, I'm going to make sure I'll sign to you, you getting Olam Abba with me. I mean, listen, the Olam Abba of Levi Yitzchak from Bardichov, that's uh, not too bad. That's a... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he tells him, really? Oh. Now this guy's a businessman, right away. The wheels are turning. He says, oh, getting a Ganeden of uh, Levi from Bardichov, sitting next to him. I want it in writing. No problem. Pull out a paper, they write everything. And Levi from Bardichov tells him, you are going to be sitting with me in Gan Eden. <sighs> this guy now hit the jackpot. Okay, comes the evening. Yom Tov comes, the holiday dwells on the city. He goes to the shul and prays. The service is over, everybody goes home, and he's just uh, standing there in the shul by himself. Nobody invited him to come and eat. And he's like, what? 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 Where's everybody? Before he, he said Jack Robinson, everybody went. Nobody invited him. He doesn't know what to do. It's Chag, it's holiday. I have to do Kiddush. I have to eat. I have to be sitting in a, in a sukkah. I have to say the blessing. I don't have a sukkah. He goes to the first sukkah. Excuse me, uh, I'm the one here with the trog. Can I come in? Sorry, <laughs> no room. Go. He goes to the next sukkah. Knocks on the, the. Can I come in? No, we're very sorry. We don't have room for you. But I'm the guy with the trog. Come tomorrow, we don't have room for you. He's like, oh, okay, I got it. They were frauding me. I, they, they, they got me. They got me to stay here so they can use my etrog, and neither one of them even invited me to the meal. And he's getting upset, and he's going from one sukkah to another sukkah, and everybody pushes him up. He got so upset, he's like, I'm going to go to the sukkah of Lezvitzchak from Bardichov. He comes and knocks on the door of the sukkah. Can I come in? And Yitzhak tells him, I'm very sorry, there's no room here. I can't, I can't. I'll see you tomorrow in Joe. He says, listen, we had a deal. And Yitzhak says, we had a deal about the trog. We never had the deal that you're sitting in my sukkah or in any other sukkah. That was not the deal. The deal is that you bring your trog and you get the Gan Eden. It doesn't say anywhere in our deal that you're getting to sit in a sukkah and do kiddush and eat. Sorry, no room. Go out. And he lost it. I can't believe it. They frauded me. They took advantage of me. Now I'm going to do. He got so upset. Nevitzchik tells him, listen, I have a deal for you. How about I let you in my sukkah. You do kiddush. You can eat. You can say the mitzvah, have the mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah. But our deal is off. No Ganeden. Well, now, you're, now you're taking advantage of me? You want to now cancel the deal? He says, that's the deal I'm telling you. Either you get the Gan Eden with me, but you don't get the mitzvah. The, it's a mitzvah doraita. It's a mitzvah from the Torah to sit in the, in the sukkah. It's a sudat yom tov. Or you want to sit? I'll give you to sit, but you're not getting to be with me in Gan Eden. The guy said, okay, what can I do? I... Uh, I'm not going to miss a mitzvah from the Torah. They take out the contract and they rip the contract. He goes in, does kiddush, eats, sesher kitshanu b'mitzvotzav etzivanu l'shem b'sukkah, and he's uh, a little bit upset. Now, comes the, the moment later, and he's very, very upset with Levi Yitzchak. He says, you frauded me. You, I, I'm not happy with this deal. So he tells him, now... From what you did, not only that you're going to get your Kiddush and your Sukkah, you're going to get the Gan Eden with me. Because what's the point? 
the fact that you were able to, you were, you were willing to lose the sitting with Ganin and with me to do a mitzvah in this world. Another person would say, no, I am not, I'm missing the mitzvah. I'm staying with you in Gan Eden. But it was so important to you to do the mitzvah in this world, you are willing to give the Gan Eden to be with me. So just because you were willing to do that, not only did you get to do the mitzvah and sit with me in the sukkah, you'll still get the Gan Eden with me. So what's the idea? This is the story, but what's the idea behind it? The Torah is called Torah Chaim. The Torah of life. Basically saying, this is the real world. The Torah is in this world. The Torah doesn't want you to focus on the world above. The Torah wants to focus on this world. If all day long I would focus on the world above, what would I do here? If the Torah is going to talk to me all day long about Gan Eden, about Olam Abba, then my, my mind constantly would be on Olam Abba. The Torah says, no, you have to focus on this world. This is the world where you do the mitzvot. This is the world where you learn Torah. This is the world where Hashem put you in. If I'm going to talk about uh, Gan Eden, Gan Eden is, is the retirement. It's uh, what they have in Florida, all the old age olds, all the people go to Florida to retire. So this is when you retire, Gan Eden is retirement. Here is where you live. That's why it's called Torah Chaim, the Torah of living. Because here you can do the mitzvot. You know, there's a, <clears throat> there's a Mishnah that says, Yafa Sha'achat Shel Tshuva Masim Tovim Ba'olam Azeh Mikol Chay Olam Abba. One hour of doing good action, do good deeds or, or a mitzvah or tshuva in this world is greater than the entire Lama Ba. Because really this is the world. This is uh, the Kadosh Baruch What cares about is that you're going to live in this world and do a mitzvah. His pleasure, Hashem's pleasure, is that a Jew will go over, over overpower his Yetzer Hara and do a mitzvah. That's what Hashem wants. He doesn't want you to focus on the Lama Ba. If He would want you to focus on the Lama Ba, He would leave you in the Lama Ba. Kadosh Baruch says, I want you to focus in this world. There's another story that kind of uh, strengthened this idea that a few hundred years ago, there was a great sage known as the Gaon from Vilna. And uh, not even one second that his mouth was not busy with talking Torah. Genius. Knew the Torah inside out, reached to levels that we can't even fathom. Up until today, thousands of students, books, commentaries, Aisha <clears throat> Lokim, a man of God. There's no even uh, words to describe the level of, of what, he, what he achieved. And on his deathbed, moments before he dies, he, he's crying. And the students come to him and like, why are you crying? So he says, because you know why I'm crying? He takes his tzitzit and he pulls out his tzitzit and says, I'm crying because of this. And they're like, Okay, why are you crying because of the tzitzit? He says, because where I'm going to, I won't be able to wear this. I can't wear tzitzit in Olam Abba. So, the real life is in this world. This is where you take advantage. This is where you actually do what the Torah tells you. You can't follow the Torah in the world above. Gan Eden, you're just sitting. You're enjoying the Torah, you're enjoying your reward. But the real action is done in this world. And the Torah wants to emphasize that focus on this world. Don't focus on the world above. Every moment in this world, you can grab a mitzvah. Every moment in this world, you can do something good. Or chas v'shalom, you can do something not good. But if constantly my mind, my mind will be on Gan Eden and Gehenom, what would I, I wouldn't even do anything here. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to even do a, half a mitzvah here. So the Torah comes and says, I don't want you to focus on Olam Abba. I want you to focus on this world. I want you to focus on the mitzvot. I want you to focus on the Torah. I want you to live your life. Every second here, you can take advantage of this world. Why you think of something else? So, <clears throat> you know, another, another way how we can emphasize how we need this world more, even when a person dies and the neshama goes to the world above, what do they do when the person dies? For a whole year, they say Kaddish. Why do you need the Kaddish? If you're already in the Olam Abba, why do you need the Kaddish? Because the fact that the sun will say Kaddish, they push the Neshama higher and higher and higher, and they elevate the Neshama. So obviously, even when the Neshama is in the world above, they still need this world. So there's not for nothing Hashem created this world. There's a reason why Hashem created this world. So to conclude it, the Torah comes and says, I don't want you to 
fantasize all day long on, on the world to come and Gan Eden and Ramaba, or think all day long of Gainom. It's not going to get you anywhere. I want you to think on this world. I want you to think of every second how you can either grab a mitzvah or waste a moment of your life. You don't have a long time here. What do you have here? 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. Some people are not even lucky and they don't even get half of that. So the Torah comes and tells you, value every moment of this life. Because every moment in this life you can do a mitzvah. And that's the real purpose. Is to grab another, don't, another mitzvah and another mitzvah. Don't worry about the reward right now. It's like uh, somebody told me not too long ago. I don't remember the whole story. I think it was actually your father that told me that. That uh, maybe, your, maybe your uncle, maybe you'll recognize the story. He was working as a delivery boy somewhere. And he would get tips with coins. And the, all the coins that he got, he put in this big uh, bottle. He never touched it. And then he was uh, planning on going to Israel on a trip or something. He took that bottle. It was like $7,000 there. Something like, I never touched it, right? Yeah. So, this is like a, you don't get the, the money now. Just put it now. Just put it. One day you'll get it. Whoa, wow. That's what I want. What I got. So don't count your reward now. Oh, I'm going to do this mitzvah. I'm going to go here. Torah says, focus on the moment. Live your life. You don't know when life is over. Life can go like that. And if you're lucky, life will be long. Most people are dwelling on the, on the sadness and the negativity in this world. They don't realize that every moment I'm alive. I'm breathing. Look, my hands are working. I can, I can do something. Most people, they fall to the negative side. And they fall to sadness and depression and, and uh, uh, you know, bad thoughts and enjoy your life. Even if life is bad, everybody has a bad life. If you think you're the only one, everybody has a bad life. Everybody's struggling. Everybody has challenges. This is part of life. That's what Hashem wants. Hashem wants you to overpower the challenge, to rise above the occasion. So most people, they fall into the despair of this world. Talk comes and tells you, live the moment. Enjoy every moment. Every moment you're here, you're alive. Do something positive. Read some Torah. Help that person. Do something good. Every moment, take advantage. Don't count your, your reward right now. Don't count your savings. Who cares about that right now? This is not what I need to care about. You know the famous story, the Baal Shem Tov was dying to come to Israel. Dying. That was his goal, his dream, was to come to live in Eretz Israel. He did whatever he could to come. At some point, he got already fed up. He left by himself with his daughter. And this is a journey that took months. It's not like today you hop on a plane. You know, what I'm still with Nefesh a whole month. He was without anything, without a Sefer Torah, without a Minyan. Just him. I don't care. I'm going to Eretz Israel. In this journey, at some point, he stopped in Turkey. And it was Erev Pesach. It was the eve of Pesach. And... They didn't have any plans, any money, anything. Eve of Pesach, he doesn't even have matzot. He doesn't even know where he's going to do the whole holiday. But that was the level of Emunah of the Baal Shem Tov. He didn't plan. Wherever I'll go, Hashem will make sure everything works. Long story short, sure enough, there was a very rich individual in that city that uh, was dying to meet the Baal Shem Tov. And he heard that uh, somehow he heard that the Baal Shem Tov reached the town. And he started pulling all his connections. How do I find him? He's in town. Sure enough, he finds the Baal Shem Tov's daughter. And he tells her, I know your father's in town. First of all, I'm inviting you to spend the whole Pesach with me. I have matzot, I have wine, I have everything. Right on the spot, the problem of Pesach got solved. Then, of course, he wanted to get a, a meeting, a private audience with the Baal Shem Tov. Now, the Baal Shem Tov has an angel. It's called a Magid. That uh, whispered in his ear everything that is about to happen. Many tzaddikim had that Arizal, Yosef Karo, they had a little angel that tell them this is about to happen. So, for example, the, somebody would come in the, to a meeting with the Arizal. You think the Arizal would sit with you and schmooze with you on a cup of coffee? You, you would come in, he would already know your question and tell you the answer within three words. 30 seconds max, you get the answer out. So it's not like today. Today you go speak with a rabbi, oh, start telling him the whole history of the entire world. So the Rizal, one minute, what do you need? You don't even have to ask a question. Send him with the Baal Shem Tov. This guy walks in. He didn't have to start explaining what he wants. The Baal Shem Tov right away turns around to him and tells him, you're going to have a baby boy this year. 
Ah, that's what I wanted. And why the guy wanted to get a blessing from the Baal Shem that he didn't have a boy? So, and the Baal Shem Tov gives him a blessing that he should have a baby boy. Right away comes out a heavenly voice and announces in the heavens to the Baal Shem Tov, you have just lost your Lama Ba. What? Yes, because this person was not supposed to have children and you announced out loud that he should have a boy and the tzaddik says something, it decrees, the heavens, the Kadosh who have to do it and you just said he's going to have a boy, now you went against the heavenly court and he, they have to apply, they have to give him the boy, but for that you lost your Lama Ba, your entire world to come. Baal Shem Tov starts dancing wild. And he starts going crazy, he's dancing, jumping up and down of joy. Everybody's like, are you out of your mind? You just lost your Lama Ba, why are you dancing? She says, oh, finally I can serve Hashem without any agenda. I don't have any reward, I lost my Lama Ba, now I can really serve Hashem for the sake of serving Hashem. So I'm happy. And he's dancing the, the night away. Right away a heavenly voice comes out and says, just because of this attitude, you're going to get now a double portion of your Olam Abba. But the Baal Shem Tov, he's like, I don't want to work. When, when, when there's a reward, when there's some type of an agenda, what kind of Avodat Hashem is that? That I know, oh, I'm going to do this, because uh, here I'm going to, one day I'm going to get a reward. If there wouldn't be a reward, then I would serve Hashem 100% for the sake of serving Hashem. And that's what the Torah wants to teach you. The Torah wants to teach you, serve Hashem for the sake of serving Hashem, be thankful that the Kadosh Baruch even created you and He's giving you the time of day and He's allowing you to participate in His mitzvot. That in itself is what we say, Dayenu. What we say in uh, every Shabbat when we pray, every Pesach, even if He would just take us out of Mitzrayim and even take us to, to get to Torah, Dayenu, it's enough, He did enough. So we have to cherish, first of all, every moment of my life. I don't know how long my life, I don't know how long. I, I, maybe this today is the last day, I don't know. People go out into the street, they get run over. Car accidents, heart attacks, diseases, you don't know when you're leaving. Some people they have some type of a deadline, the doctor tells them, I'm sorry to tell you, you have three months to live. These are lucky people because they have time to do tshuva. Some people don't have time. Car hits them and out, one shot. So you have to cherish your life. Torah is coming to teach you something very deep, it's telling you don't waste your life. Don't waste your life of thinking of what if. This is the question I can't stand. The two questions that I cannot tolerate. Why and what if? Well, what do you mean why? You think you're going to get an answer? You think you're going to get it? You think Hashem is going to send you an email and tell you why something happened? He's not going to tell you why. So stop asking why. And a more annoying question is what if? What if? Don't say what if. It's like my kids, they fantasize. Imagine you would have a special power and you can get all the candy in the world. If you would have special power, that's what you want, candy? <laughs> but you know, kids, they, what if? It's such a stupid question, what if? Don't ask what if, because it's not going to happen, it's not intent to happen even. So the Torah comes and tells you, don't fantasize on something that might not happen, focus on the moment. Live the moment, cherish the moment, and take advantage of every second of, the, of, of your life. And focus on what you need to do now. Don't worry right now about your reward. If you get a reward, you'll get it. Don't worry. Kadosh Baruch Hu is ne'eman l'filatet tzcharo. is trustworthy to give the reward. So that's why the Torah is not talking about Gan Eden, Because it wants you to focus on the moment. And that's what we need to take from that. We like to apply practically what we're learning. If, you, if, I, take, if I come here and I learn and I leave the room and I don't do anything with it, then I wasted, <coughs> wasted my time. Better off to sleep. So you want to go out of the room with, with something. And the Torah comes to deliver something very, very important. Is that really value your life. Value your own life. Value your time. Value other people's time. It's not your time. Value other people's jobs, their work, their opinions. Because this is, this world, every second, uh, the second's here. Oh, now the second disappeared. And then the second will never come back. Can't rectify the time. And maybe say sorry, but you can bring time back. So we have to cherish very much our time and to utilize our time and to take advantage of our time to do only, thing, only positive things and to focus on what am I doing right now? Am I doing good or am I not doing good? Am I using my time right or am I wasting my time? 
Am I sitting on Facebook now for three hours? Or am I going to learn Torah, help another person, do something positive in this world? So that's what I need to t- carry with me. And that's the main reason why the Torah doesn't want to talk about Ulam It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Focus on Ulam Azim.